In an industry stuffed with marketing bullshit, empty promises, and shiny suited liars, one woman's had enough. She knows what it's like to have the wrong clients, no money, and no time for fun. But she also knows how to fix it. And on the Business for Superheroes show, she promises to tell the down and dirty truth about business, sales, and running away with the circus. Here's your host, Vicki Fraser. Hello and welcome to the Business for Superheroes show, um, or possibly the 1000 Authors show. I'm Vicky Fraser, and this is my husband, Joe. Hello. Hello. And this is Noodle. I don't know if you can hear him purring. Maybe. Uh, he's purring on my knee. He's not very happy because there is a dog in the next room. Not good for the cats. a house guest. Actually, they've been, they've been very good. They've been very good. But he's, he'd prefer not to have a dog in the room next door. Yes, he would. He's a, he's a little bit he's a little bit affronted by the whole thing. Um, anyway, we are drinking Tarquin's gin and tonic tonight. Cheers. And this was a gift from my very lovely bestest mate, Emma, down in Cornwall. Hi, Em. Um, Hi, Em. And when she came to visit. And it's fantastic. It's Cornish Blackberry Gin. It's very lovely. It's very lovely. It's very purple. Very gin. Mm. Very, very Blackberry. But they also, they also have beautiful. Um, they also have beautiful bottles. So, if you're watching the video version of this podcast, you can see the beautiful bottle with a wax, you know, wax seal. It's it's, it's just lovely, kind of frosted glass. Mm. It's got a. Oh, I love it. I do love a beautiful bottle and some nice packaging. Um, so yes, Tarquin's gin. Very good. Very good. Very nice. Um, also, we've been we, we have got a topic to talk about tonight, um, which is writer's block is a big fat myth, and it is. And if you don't believe me, then you're wrong. Controversial, maybe I don't care. And we will I will explain we will explain why um, later. But before we do that, we've been promising to talk about purple apparently for quite some weeks now, and um, Jen texted me the other day to call me out on it and say, Hi, Jen. When are you going to talk about purple? Hi, Jen. And that was a reasonable question. So, Joe, what did you want to say about purple? Well... It's actually, it's actually relevant to this week's topic, as you will it's, discover. So, so there's, there's multiple people on the interwebs who will describe this and explain it much better than I will. Mm -hmm. But, in a nutshell, there is no light frequency that um, corresponds to the colour purple. Okay. So... What you see as uh, what you see as purple is um, a fictitious colour that is created by your brain when uh, both the red and the blue cones in your eyeballs are activated. There's no colour to go with it. Wow! It's, so there, there are no a, purple flowers. There are no purple flowers. Well, I mean, there are, but it's it's just a colour that your brain invents. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, so yeah, it's it's <laughs> so it's very actually. Um, we you can't really tell if everybody sees purple as the same thing. Maybe mm. not. Okay, so Joe, what does what does this? This is red. That's red. Okay, I suppose it is kind of red. Yeah. Find me a purple thing. No. Oh. I mean, we all we all we will all recognise it as purple, but it's not necessarily the same thing that we see. Fair enough. Mm. Okay. So, but I I remember. Um, I don't know if it, we haven't talked about that in a podcast before, but you and I have had that conversation before, mm. haven't we? And it's been really cool. So it's 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 things that our brains make up that mm. aren't really there. Our brains are awesome at it. They are awesome at it because they do it all the time. They do it for stuff that we because there are so many signals coming into our bodies from our eyes, our nose, our ears, everything that we can't possibly process all that information. So we filter most of it out. And then we kind of fill in the gaps again, don't we? Yeah, and this this whole kind of visual field that everybody sees that starts, you know, 120 degrees to the right and finishes 120 degrees to the left or whatever it is. It's it's, it's mostly it, filled in by memory. Isn't it's it? mostly filled in with memory and and you know assumptions, assumptions and thoughts and whatnot. It's yeah. we're getting all these little snapshots of vision and stitching the rest of it together inside your brain. That's why if you've ever wondered how a cyclist or a motorcyclist has suddenly appeared in the road next mm -hmm. to you when you were turning out and you've gone, Jesus, that's that's why, because your brain is 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 filling in the gap that it can't see with road. 
because it yeah. knows what a road looks like, and a road is really obviously a road is grey. Probably a road, probably cars, uh, bits maybe of cars. But yeah, it's, it's going to be basically it's going to fill in with the stuff that it knows. Is and it's, I think for people, for us, it's a little bit different because we ride motorbikes, mm-hmm. and so we expect to see motorbikes because we are often on one. But um, for people who don't ride motorbikes, that's when the sorry mate didn't see you thing comes, and they knock people off their motorbikes because the the brain their brain does not fill in that gap with a motorbike. Yeah, because it's not expecting to see one. It's really interesting. Really interesting. So when when people say sorry, mate, I didn't see you, they genuinely did not see you. Yeah, they, they didn't. You yeah. can argue that they didn't look properly, and that's true as well. But um, but yes, always a motorcyclist out there always assume that you're invisible because mm. it always used to make me laugh because I used to hear people say on that forum we used to be a member of, oh, assume that everybody's out to kill you, and it's like, well, no, because that's assuming that they actually have noticed you at all, mm. and you know they're not out to kill you. It's like assume that you're invisible. And Assuming you're invisible is a is a really good 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 tactic. I think so. Mm. I came up with that on my own. <laughs> um, anyway, the reason that I think that purple and the whole your brain making things up thing is relevant to this evening's talk rumblings podcast, rumblings um, is because writer's block does not exist. That is my thesis. Why are you making that face? Well, because lots of people experience it. Just like they experience purple mm. and gaps they? in traffic that don't have motorbikes in them. But do they experience it? But do they really? Uh. I'm going to dismantle that bit, that that um, argument. Um, I'm going to start with plumber's block, doctor's block, taxi driver's block. Pl- plumber's block sounds like something that just needs a plunger. <laughs> well, exactly. It's like it just needs a plunger. Uh, you don't hear of doctors saying that they've got doctor's block or taxi driver's block or teacher's block or... Do you not? No. When have you ever heard anyone say that? They, they don't, I reckon teachers spend quite a lot of time stood at the front of the class, just flapping their flapping their mouth open and closed, wondering what to say. <laughs> Certainly, some of my teachers did. <laughs> I think that's a different problem. <laughs> um, but no, they don't. They they don't experience these blocks. They just show up and do the work. Right. And that is my argument. Uh, it sounds. I'm gonna. I'm gonna elaborate a little bit because it's a little bit harsh to say just sit down and shut up and do the work, but. Essentially, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> that, and this is this is why it's like our brain makes stuff up. Writer's block, I think, is a lie that we tell ourselves to get out of doing the work. Right. So, you know, oh, I've got writer's block, so I I can't write today. So I'm just going to go and watch ten hours of Buffy the Vampire Slayer straight and wait for inspiration to strike. Which it doesn't. Which it does not. No. Um, and that it, is frankly ten hours of TV watching that's just gone down the toilet, isn't it? Well, watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer is never time wasted. But yes, it's, uh, when you, when you want to be writing your book, for example, um, as you know, I and my clients will be wanting to do, it is a little bit of a problem. Mm. So, I mean, if you if you've booked out ten hours to sit in the sofa under a blanket and watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer, then you know, awesome. That's that's a great day to spend, <laughs> and I might do that in uh, the coming winter months. Yes, because um, it's been quite a while since I've watched Buffy. And I was listening to. I'm not the... watching all of Buffy again. It is you. great though. <laughs> We've been through it like three times now. I'm not. Ex- no, we have not. I'm not expecting <laughs> you to watch it again. Anyway, um, the reason that I object to the term writer's block is because it implies an external cause and a problem that is caused by something or someone else that you can blame and that you can use as an excuse. But the truth is actually quite the opposite. Right. And so, shall I elaborate? Or should I just leave it there and annoy people? Just leave it to you. Um, yeah, yeah, do people... Why are you, why are you whiffling? Do people, you, do, do people actually think writer's block is a real thing? They do. Do people and use it? Or are they, are they being like ironic and, and kind of do. witty about the fact that they know they're procrastinating and talking rubbish? If I told you that people have been prescribed Prozac for writer's block, what would you do? Roll my eyes pretty hard. Yeah, I was waiting for you to do that. That's actually happened. Okay, so there's a really interesting article in The New Yorker that I read a while ago, and I've put a link in the show notes. Ritalin would probably work better. Carry on. (laughs) Dr. Joe prescribes Ritalin. Don't. Joe is not a doctor. Don't listen to Joe. (laughs) Um, Derailed my train. Sorry. All over the place. Sorry. Carriages everywhere. (laughs) Um, Yeah, really interesting article in the New Yorker that I read um, quite a while ago called, I can't remember what it's called, but the link's in the show notes. It was about writer's block and it starts off talking about Samuel Taylor Coleridge of Water, Water, All Around fame. Right. 
And one, he was, he was, that is the, he did write that, didn't he? I have no idea. The Ancient Mariner, the rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Is that Coleridge? Yes. Oh my God, now I feel like I've... Who, who was Cthulhu? That was, um, not Coleridge, that was, uh, what's his face? That was H.P. Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft, right, right, okay. <laughs> We're having, terrible terrible having, education. Terrible education. Having a literary existential <laughs> crisis right now. I'm, I've now talked myself out of the fact that Samuel Taylor Coleridge wrote the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, and I'm sorry. I did. would Google it, but we're videoing, so I can't. Yeah, right. Um, there may be an addendum to this podcast <laughs> in which I re-record the whole thing. Um, yeah, anyway, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. He was one of the first cases of writer's block the first known cases of writer's block, um, because he stopped writing in his late 20s. Most of his famous poems came from his mid-20s. Right. The ones that we would we would know, and that's, we might have studied at school. <laughs> um, clearly don't know. <laughs> I know, you just talked me out of it. Um, and after that, after that time, um, any ambitious writing projects inspired in him what he called an indefinite, indescribable terror, and he gave terror a capital T. Okay. Um, I kind of know how he feels. I, just, I go through life with an indefinite, indescribable terror. Um, but he actually wasted most of the rest of his life addicted to opium. And every, is every, that technically a waste? I think so, yeah, yeah. It probably is, yes, okay. When you were as wonderfully accomplished at writing as him, you just wasted the rest. And, you know, his contemporaries would kind of come up to him and be like, dude, what are you doing? Sort and yourself he'd be like, out. And, and he'd be like, I can't, I am paralysed and disabled and I cannot sort my shit out. Um, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about addiction here um, because that's that's an entirely different thing. I'm talking about the fact that he stopped writing because he decided that he was blocked um, and some. But it's, it's really interesting because writers have probably suffered from this kind of thing, you know, have probably suffered in writing since the beginning of writing. But it was only from like the early 19th century that writer's block became a thing. Okay. It got, it got given a name. It got given a name. And the reason is because the idea of writing as an art form changed this is this is really interesting. I find I find this really interesting because I'm a writer and a nerd. Um, but before, like the early 1900s, before the rom- the romantic poets and and that kind of thing, the romantic writers, writers thought of writing as like a rational, purposeful activity which they controlled. Right. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go for a walk and I'm gonna think of some ideas. And I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna write a poem or a book or whatever. Did it kind of coincide with the invention of the novel? No, novels came before that. Really? Yeah. Okay. I was just trying to think of one that came before that, and now I can't think of any, and you've destroyed me. Um, <laughs> Bronte and all that, that was before 19... 19- that was before the... Yeah, there were novels before that. But the, the 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 fashion of kind of romantic poetry and stuff. The early romantics, though, as I was saying, before I was so rudely interrupted again... I, that's what I'm here for. Yeah. Rude interruptions. <laughs> Gin drinking. So... Earlier writers thought of writing as a rational, purposeful activity, which they controlled, right? right? But the romantics, the early romantic writers and poets saw writing as external and somehow magically bestowed upon them. Right. So that's where I think the, the difference came. And um, Percy Shelley, who was another noted total junkhead. Um, as in Mary Shelley's fella? Yes, Mary okay. Shelley's fella um, said, "A man cannot say I can. I will compose poetry, um, because poetry was the product of some invisible influence, like an inconstant wind, which basically blew the material into the poet. <laughs> he just had to wait for it to happen. And um, basically, drugs really fucked up art for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I think drugs also created some really cool art, like Kublai Khan and Kublai Khan did whatever. Xanadu." Thingy D. Decree, like Coleridge as well. Decree. Anyway, um, Xanadu. In, yeah. So, but yeah, they were they were like, oh, you know, we've we've just got to sit here and we've got to wait for the poetry muse to fart poetry in our general direction, and then we'll be able to write it. It's like we don't write it; it it is it, 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 it is produced through us. We are merely the mechanism for putting it on paper. Yeah, and. You know what? Maybe maybe that's the case. I can't say for 100% sure. I am not the all-knowing oracle of everything. But I tend to side with the pre-romantic writers who saw writing as a thing that they did and they sat down and they controlled it and they decided what was going to happen and when it was going to happen and they didn't sit down and wait for inspiration to strike because you will die of old age before that happens. Right. Um, so, but yeah, like I said earlier, with 
the Prozac thing, the New Yorker in the same article also said that blocked writers are now being treated with antidepressants such as Prozac, though some report that the drugs tend to eliminate their desire to write together with their regret over not doing so. So it doesn't really help. And I remember when I was on antidepressants, it kind of removed the despair, but it also removed any enthusiasm for anything. Mm. And that's not really a very good thing. It's not productive. No. Um, as a short-term fix, awesome. Um, you know, because, it, it, yeah, it was a short-term fix for all sorts of nastiness. But as a long-term fix, it's a really, it's a hell of a horrible way to live. So do you see writer's block as... Uh, a thing separate to general procrastination and no. inability to achieve. No, not really. I think that I think that it has been given a name. I think that those things have because, been given because a name. of the poor artistic writers. Yeah, and I and I, yeah, a little bit. And I also don't think that there is any one because you you kind of said you know, is it separate to procrastination? Is it separate to perfectionism? Is it separate to fear? I think they're all parts of the same you know that it's not as simple as saying oh it's writer's block and that's one thing there are many many reasons that you might not be able to it is a many faceted jewel it is a many faceted pile of poop but yeah it's i think sometimes it's just really bloody hard to write hmm. and to think and to do anything creative i mean you're you're creative you solve problem engineering problems sometimes it must be really difficult to sit down and think about that kind of thing right you must you must have days where it's like Ugh, I'd rather actually just, you know, mm. eat cheese or whatever. Yes, eat sausage sandwiches. Because it's it's a, it's a similar thing, but it's like we don't talk about engineering blocks. You, know, no. you wouldn't refer to you wouldn't refer to it as a creative block, would you? You'd just be like today has not been very productive. I kept getting distracted, and I did other things instead. And sometimes <laughs> that just happens, and. You know, it might be that you haven't done enough thinking about other things mm -hmm. because creativity, all creativity is, is making connections between sure. different stuff. And so writers, because I think it's it's just sometimes difficult. It, to be creative is sometimes really difficult. And that doesn't mean that you have writer's blog. It means that you have to sit down and work harder at it hmm. or go out for a walk and work harder at it. But not just kind of sit there and go, oh, I have writer's block and therefore I'm going to use that as an excuse to goof off for the day. And there's there's... Loads of techniques for moving beyond a big blank piece of paper that's staring at you. Yeah. You know, there's all kinds of planning and breakdowns and bullet points and, and you know, key facts and all, all sorts of flow charts and diagrams and all sorts of stuff that you could be doing that is all productive and gets your thoughts on the paper and gets the paper not blank. And there are other things that you can do as well that are really good fun and are equally as important as all the things that you've just mentioned. Like, no, but playing... I think right. adults don't play anymore. And, you know, last last night, and this is actually, this is a really, really good thing. So last night, and it's not last night while you're listening to it, it's last night while we're recording it. Um, I was at a dance class, uh, contemporary dance, which I always find a little bit terrifying because even though I am an aerial dancer, I am not a ground dancer. I find it a little bit frightening mm -hmm. to, to dance. And um, Beth, hi Beth. Hi Beth. Um, is an excellent teacher. And she was, she had the whole class doing stuff. And she's like, oh, we're going to play a game. And so she had us, she had us point out four different parts of the room. So the logo, the mirrors, the ceiling, and the curtain in, in the dance studio. And then she was like, name body parts. Okay, so left foot, um, right arm, head, back. And then she paired those things together. And she was like, right, I want you to throw your left foot towards the mirror. Do something with your left foot towards the mirror. Do something with your head towards the curtain. Do you know what I mean? And just mm -hmm. those things, those simple Simple movements, so simple triggers. combinations of ideas, triggers, had us, and we created some really cool dance moves. And these are people, and she was like, you've just choreographed mm -hmm. a little piece of choreography. And that's a really big deal for a bunch of people who don't consider themselves to be dancers, you know? And I like to do similar things with my, with my clients and my writers and the people that I'm coaching to get them thinking about how they can, how they can write and get their creativity going and in ways that aren't necessarily related to the topic that you want to write about. It's, it's just about getting you thinking and getting, getting you, getting you unstuck, mm -hmm. but you have to put the work in. And so for last night with the dance class, Beth's idea of getting us to put the work in was to give us these triggers. And it was like, oh, I couldn't possibly choreograph a piece of dance. Oh, wait a minute. I just did. Here's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I think writer's block is not a condition that can be cured. And it's definitely not something that happens to us from the outside. I think what it is at its core is just a lot of fear. It's like 
layer upon layer of fear because we're terrified of failing. Sometimes we're terrified of succeeding. Success mm-hmm. is a scary thing. Um, and we're afraid to just like ship it, as Seth Godin would say. You know, just 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 get it out there. Just put it out. Just put it out. And I think it's an excuse. I think writing this block is an excuse because writing is really hard. Creating anything is really hard. And whether that's a painting or a sculpture or a poem or an article or an engineering problem that you might be solving, mm-hmm. some of them are really difficult, right? Yes. And if you just sat there and waited for inspiration to strike, what would happen? It probably wouldn't. No. So how do how do you how do you solve engineering problems when you're like when you would just rather go and stick your head in a bucket and not look at it because it's really difficult? What sorts of things do you do to kind of spark ideas off? Um I stand up, I put a pen in my hand, I stand next to a whiteboard and I start drawing. Do you, what do you draw? Mm. Willies. Think <laughs> Things related to the thing I'm, I'm thinking about, usually. Um, and invariably, another engineer will wander past eating a sausage sandwich and go, um, they'll be like, what, what, what are you doing there? And I'll describe the problem. It's a cat. There's a cat whinging in the background. Noodle. Oh. Being naughty. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain the problem to the other engineer and they will almost invariably pop up with a bright idea or a suggestion or two and we'll draw a few things out and discard as rubbish and then move on. But... We've got beyond a blank piece of paper. We've got a few thoughts. We've got a few ideas, and, and we can we can get cracking. Cool. And I know you've told me before as well that you have had people come to you with problems, and they're like, "Oh, this is an unsolvable problem. We can't we can't do this. It's impossible." Mm. And you've been like, "Well, we did actually. We did something a little bit similar in like the pharmaceutical industry or something." Yeah, I mean, one of the things that happens in in, in my world is that I, I spend a lot of time in automotive places. I spend time in FMCG. I spend time in all kinds of different fast moving consumer goods. Yeah, cans, packets of crisps, small things, um, and and. Usually, the people who work in those industries don't move much. You know, if you're if you're a person who puts food in cans, you might work in a cat food factory and you might work in a baked bean factory, but your your skills are putting things in cans uh, and the machinery that does that. So, when somebody walks in from the automotive industry, usually we've got some pretty good thoughts. Okay. It works well. It works well. So, yeah, we we kind of cross pollinate across a lot of different industries. Yeah, and there was I was having a conversation with somebody last night actually, and and she, she just said, she said, "Oh, I saw I saw you posted your guitar play." I'm learning to play the guitar again. Um, I saw you posted your guitar playing video, and I was like, "How do you find time to do all this stuff? You know, you run a business, and you're renovating a cottage, and you're you know you spend all this time at the studio, and now you're learning to play the guitar." Mm-hmm. I was like, "I'm learning Spanish as well." And she was like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> And I mean, part of the reason that I can do all those things is that I have designed my life in such a way that, you mm. know, I've got space for it. Also, we don't have children. That helps, I think. That definitely helps. <laughs> and also, also, I really love learning stuff. I think it's really, really important to learn as much as possible about as many things as possible. Mm. And that's part of the reason why I can come up with really good ideas. You know, people, I was talking to one of my coaching clients today and she was, I came up with an idea for her. She's like, that's such a good idea. And the reason that I come up with good ideas is because I am interested in so many things and I'm learning stuff all the time. I listen to tons of podcasts and mm-hmm. I read a lot and, you know, it's not, it's, it, I don't know. So I'm not it's like not a, magic. It's not magic. No, I'm be interested, be curious. The best way, the best way to beat writer's block or to be any creative block is to be interested in as much stuff as you can. Mm. And, you know, we live in this incredible universe that is filled with, wonders and amazingness and just really cool stuff it's not all doom and gloom stop listening to so much news the world is an incredible place there is so much to be interested in that i am always baffled when i hear somebody say i'm bored (laughs) it's like how can how can you be bored what you're clearly not paying attention (laughs) yeah and you know it's, it's like if you're if you're bored go for a walk and think or just sit and think or watch a tv show or pick up a book some you know something there is so much to be interested go, in. Go and break out of your routine. Go and do something else. Yeah, and so if if you're thinking you know that you've got writer's block that it's hard that you don't want to do it, that's fine. It is hard. It is really sometimes very very hard to write stuff and to create anything. Um, but when it, when it gets really hard and we can't seem to think of anything, we we tend to blame that lack of inspiration and we blame writer's block and we blame anything rather than sit down and do the work. And I think that's the problem. Um, but a, a really odd thing happens when we kind of sit down and make words appear on paper anyway, because that's when inspiration starts to appear. Mm-hmm. Ideas start to flow. Motivation comes because 
something that I've learned over the last few years is that action doesn't come from motivation. That's not the way around that it comes. You don't, you're not motivated to act. Motivation comes from doing something. You have to start. You have to get started. And that's when motivation comes. You're not motivated. No, motivation never comes from just sitting on the sofa and doing nothing. When has that ever motivated you to do anything? It's usually motivated me to sit on the sofa some more. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) But if you, if you want to, you know, if you think if you've ever run a, you know, done a long running distance, if you ever trained running or trained anything like that, it's really hard to get out the front door. God, I hate running. It's, re- it's <laughs> Joe really hates running. It's, it's um, for children and criminals. That's all it's for. <laughs> Jesus, I hate running. I used to, I used to run a lot. You used to run a bit, but it was even though I like running or I, I liked running, I liked the being on my own and kind of you know being out in the fresh air. It was really hard to get out the door, but once you've taken a few steps it gets easier and easier and easier. That is very true. And you might get tired and you might be like, oh, I'm actually knackered now, my legs hurt. But you're motivated to keep going because you started. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm. The start is the difficult bit. The starting is the difficult bit. It's like getting out of bed is the the most tricky bit of the day. Oh, I bloody love being up early. If I could could drag my carcass out of bed at five o'clock in the morning, 10 minutes after I got out of bed or half an hour after I got out of bed, I'd be delighted because I actually love being up early. I love that feeling of smugness and I love that I'm the first person that's, you know, awakened. Seeing the day. Seeing the day. Getting out of bed is, oh, I'm very bad at it, aren't I? You're not too bad, but you're not great. I'm very bad at it. I get it. My my dad. My dad is the worst getter upper in the world. He is the most grumpy man ever. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> um, so yes, inspiration does not appear from nowhere and create wonderful writing. Inspiration comes from thinking and reading and listening and scribbling and being interested in things. Starting. Starting. Getting started. Just do something. Even if it's just a nonsense poem, like we talked about nonsense poetry a couple yeah, of episodes yeah. ago. Even if that's what you're doing, like random word association. Which which is what Beth was doing with curtains and yeah. and head that's exactly what beth was doing last night in the dance class yeah um so yeah don't, just you know professionals don't sit around and wait for inspiration to strike they get on with it even when it's the hardest thing in the world you know writers write and so can you nice yeah so um what's the takeaway joe um don't allow preconceived ideas of what's true to stop you doing what you can do <laughs> I wrote that. You did write that. <laughs> when I wasn't sure. really thinking about what I was writing. Yeah, I don't think that's the takeaway. I think the takeaway is start. It is difficult. It is hard. Distract yourself. Approach it from a different direction. Draw a picture. Write some words. Beat the blank page. Yeah. Just take, and, and, take control of yourself and write. Yeah, and be inspired by all kinds of things. You know? Don't give away your power to some mythical... You know, I don't want to talk about empowerment. It's a bit, it's a bit cheesy. But don't give away your power because you've got a lot of it. You're the... There's all the only place that power comes from is you. Mm. Don't give it away to some mythical excuse like writer's block because it, you know, mate, it's like it's like you can choose to be a victim of writer's block or you can say, "Ugh, this is really difficult, but I'm going to get on with it anyway." Yeah, I am going to start. I'm going to write some things. It's going to be rubbish, and I will edit it and throw it out. But I will have started. When I was painting earlier, this is a bit of an aside. It is still relevant. I was listening to the "You Are Not So Smart" podcast, mm-hmm. and he was talking to a really interesting neuroscientist and um, a psychologist, psychi- addiction psychiatrist, about willpower. And they pointed something out that willpower has never been proven to actually exist it's 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 like writer's block it's a thing that somebody dreamed up it's like oh willpower you've got a fine and i used to think this you've got a finite amount of willpower and if you use it all up at the beginning of the day you won't be able to do things later i do think there is merit in the whole eat the frog first yeah get it out of the way just get it out of the way and do it because that's the motivation thing but the there was um a woman did a phd study about willpower and she just did maths problems in her head over and over again for like 10 hours to stretch to see if well yeah <laughs> i know but to see if um to see if it did, if she was eventually unable to do it because the willpower ran out. And what she found was that she could always do one more. Mm-hmm. Always, always do one more. There is, and so it's like it kind of threw into question is there any such thing as willpower? And so I'm now thinking maybe there isn't any such thing as willpower. And it's just a case of reward. It's, it's the habit reward loop mm-hmm. thing. You know, you do things that are rewarding and you stop doing them if they are no longer rewarding. And that was what she was finding, the, the woman who was doing the study was. I can always do one more. I don't really want to. <laughs> but I can. But I can. And so that's something to remember as well. When you're, you know, if you're telling yourself that you've run out of willpower, question it. You know, maybe maybe that's bullshit. Maybe there's no such thing as willpower. Maybe, maybe you just need to set a better reward. <laughs> 
And for you, dear listener, your reward is going to be that you will be a published author and hold a book in your hand. And speaking of books in your hand, could you pass me my Ooh. book, please? Right. Because uh, it's time for... <laughs> you can pre-order my book. It's in the final stages of checks. You can see there's a few post-it notes through there. I'm scribbling in it. I'm getting ready to make a few changes and send it to Bill. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. Um, so that we can we can get it printed. Um, my, it's, it's Okay, so you can pre-order it at moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash pre-order the book. Um, it's going to be bloody ready by the beginning of November. It was meant to be the beginning of October. That's not happened. Are you um, procrastinating? No, I'm building a new office. Ugh. Um, I don't know what... Stupid office. See, that's the other thing. Optimism bias. I was like, yeah, I can have a week off and, and we'll build the office and I can also do all of the things that I need to do in my business. No, I can't. Of course I can't. <laughs> so yes, new office excitement as well. That's going on. I'm thinking, oh, next time, oh, the next podcast will be happening from my office. Different backdrop. <sighs> no. Well, you can't see the washing because I've carefully manoeuvred things so that you can't see the washing. But um, yeah, we'll be, we'll be in my office and that's really, really exciting. Um, so yeah if you've listened to every episode email me with your postal address and I will send you a special little gift nice and finally if you like this podcast please go to iTunes and subscribe because it helps us climb the rankings or you know go to, go to Stitcher or wherever and leave us a, yes leave us a review please because um, uh, we, we love it when people leave reviews we do and rate us five stars as Joe said or however many stars you think it deserves but if it's not five, five other podcasts are available yeah <laughs> Um, and share it if you know somebody who will enjoy our ramblings then send them a link Vicky, uh, no not vickyfraser.com podcast it's moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash podcast because my website is live now I've kind of slid that in quietly because I think it's still full of bugs <laughs> <laughs> but it looks good and I'm really I'm really proud of it do some beta testing on Vicky's website for us please yeah if you find anything that bugs you send me no send Harriet an email <laughs> <laughs> Hi Harriet. Hi Harriet. And actually on that note, I just want to give a bit of a shout out to Harriet, who is my wonderful assistant. She does a bloody brilliant job of keeping me in line and making sure that I get these podcasts out. Getting and things done. Getting things done. And she's just generally awesome. And she is absolutely stunningly beautiful burlesque dancer as well and has a fantastic um, burlesque business in Spain. What are you doing with your eyebrows? <laughs> Um, so yeah thank you to Harry and thank you as always to Podfly for being endlessly patient with, my last, Podfly, with my last minuteness and um, I promise we're going to get the rebranding stuff to you sometime this week <laughs> and we'll be back same time next week where we'll be talking we will be talking, <laughs> talking about perfectionism mm, okay. which follows on nicely from this nonsense thanks Joe no worries bye bye <laughs> Like what you've just heard? Tell your colleagues. Tell your friends. Send them to www.businessforsuperheroes.com slash podcast.